Okay, we're going to uh, get started. Uh, thanks very much for, uh, for coming. This is a stopwatch session on scholarly communications thread, and um, what we're going to have are five short Pechacucha style presentations. Um, each one will be maximum six minutes, 40 seconds long. We're going to be the time cop, make sure everything runs smoothly. At the end of the five sessions, um, you can ask a question, so please hold your questions uh, for the end. Um, so we're going to hear five five uh, presentations on five different topics and uh, a lot of diversity and a lot of, a lot of uh, great ideas and innovation. So our first uh, speakers, uh, Sven Fund and Catherine Anderson. Actually, it's just me at the moment because I'm not sure where Sven is, so um, <laughs> hopefully he'll be coming to join us soon. to our stopwatch session. Um, we're going to be very, very briefly talking about the development of a marketplace for open access, specifically um, from us at Knowledge Unmatched, based in Berlin, and here is Sven, so he can take over very quickly because the clock is running. Hi, sorry for being late, that was another um, <laughs> meeting with a platform provider. Um, great to have you here. Um, we have just a few minutes to present you why we like marketplaces and how we think open access will develop for both books and journals. Me again. Um, so just the next six minutes, if you could all maybe envision in your mind your favorite marketplace, literally a marketplace, a nice um, market where you can go just have a browse, you can literally find not just fruit but avocado to zucchini, um, there's competition, you'll have fruit stores, uh, stalls next to other fruit stores, and everything is open and you can just wander around and see a lot of products and um, a lot of choice. So please just keep your marketplace or your market in your mind for the next, probably now, five and a half minutes. Now that's exactly how KU developed. Um, from a single product in 2013, a single market stand if you want, into something which uh, covers 16 different products uh, today. And we call them products, even though they are very different initiatives, from Luminos to open funding to open analytics. Um, and what we are doing right now is looking, as always, for new partners to really grow this, because we want to cover in this marketplace uh, the transactional level of open access, really connecting the funders with those who need funding to make open access happen. So again, continuing the analogy of the market, um, if you think of your marketplace with lots of stalls, it's the same with us at KU. We have a variety of different stalls on offer, whether it's the over 100 publishing partners we have for our KU Select books and journals models, also various different um, partner models that we have. Sven just mentioned Luminos, for example, from uh, UC Press. We also have some um, complete programs from partners such as Language Science Press. Um, so really developing from just a single title um, model into a full program um, over journals books and even now open access videos. And similarly to your market, which you've hopefully still got in your mind, um, different models, whether it's um, a pledging model, title support, membership, and probably some more still to come in the future. Now, who are our customers? Um, they are libraries, mostly libraries from around the world. Uh, as you can see, I tried to choose, uh, choose a few that have the uh, city with it. Um, so we are covering about 500 libraries uh, from around the world. There are some real open experts in there, some of the first and very early movers and shakers in open access, but also in every pledging round that we do, complete newbies. Uh, so libraries that do open access for the first time, and it takes us a lot of time, as you can imagine, to convince them of our avocados or zucchinis or whatever is out there um, whenever we start. The benefits for them are equal, um, independent of size and where they are from. So there is quarterly reporting on an institutional level for what they have supported. Uh, there's an easy admin tool, which we call by the British name of Margaret, uh, that uh, makes pledging and supporting open access initiatives really easy. 
Um, and there are OCLC mark records for every title to really help libraries in their work to um, also make open access visible in channels that are, let's say, more traditional than uh, probably Google. Uh, also important to mention is we don't just work with the big names, as you just saw. Um, we also work with smaller or more, maybe more specialist um, institutions. Um, you see a few examples here. Um, interest, interestingly, the one on the right in the middle is the German Ministry of Defense who have uh, pledged one of our pop political science uh, collections. Um, we do try to encourage as many, also smaller institutions as possible to, to support KU. We offer various different uh, tier pricing models, including uh, in the US and in Canada. At the same time, everything that we offer to the big players, we also, also offer to, to all of our supporters, whether it's the quarterly institutional use reports or um, outreach via social media, and we do want to get a really good mix of library supporting KU. This is the last minute. Uh, we, uh, are, we have a dream and we are pushing for something uh, new here, which is also consolidating in this marketplace um, book processing charges. Um, so um, it's just starting uh, the, the equivalent to APCs if you want. BPCs, what we are trying to do here is to offer a research tool to libraries and uh, to researchers so that it's really easy for them to find their publisher of choice uh, when it comes to open access. It's completely free to, and easy to use for everybody. We always refer to it as an Airbnb. And only when a transaction takes place, um, there are costs um, um, evolving around this. Now we don't have time for the next slides, but I hope you are curious enough to visit our market stand uh, rather sooner than later. Thanks for your attention. Okay, the Open Access Digital Theological Library. Uh, so the address is there, uh, ladtl.org. But our thesis is that in uh, religious studies, the primary problem of OA content is not quantity or quality, it is discoverability. And our mission is to make content discoverable. That we are, our mission is to make all open access content in religious studies, in religious fields, psychology, philosophy, some anthropology, sociology, social science, uh, discoverable to everyone, everywhere in the world through a single search experience for free, forever, in a non-commercial environment. And we take every aspect of that seriously. The way that we have done that is we got a separate instance of OCLC's World Share and set up a separate iOS that only handles open access. Uh, for people can go to the website anywhere in the world and access that through the website oadtl.org, or people who are WMS users can simply activate our collections in their iOS, or people who use Collection Manager can simply go there and download the KBAR sheets and add them to their collection. Our mission is to make it discoverable. We believe we have the right tool in OCLC's world share. Uh, as of uh, yesterday, we had 148,000 ebooks in our collection, 29,000 in the last 25 years. In religious studies, things have a very long tail. A few years ago, they did a study of dissertations at Notre Dame in our one school. The average citation was 26 years old. Uh, 19,000 for the last 10 years, 11,000 for the last five years, uh, over 2,500 open access journals. The important thing is we have two full-time equivalent employees who only catalog open access. That's their entire job. I was at Berkeley a few weeks ago at an OA con uh, conference ask them how many the UC system, the largest library, academic library system in the world with the largest budget, had dedicated to OA cataloging, one half of one person. We're doing this just religious studies, two people working full time on this, the equivalent of two people. The schools that sponsor it, Claremont Schools of Theology and these other seminaries you see listed here. Uh, the, where we are getting our content, it is all curated, we don't just take a batch of mass files that may or may not work, but it's all curated content. Brill, the Greuter, University of Chicago, Cambridge, Oxford, Gorgias Press, uh, all the uh, university presses that have OA content. We go to their site, we match the uh, existing 
OCLC record with a stable URL, uh, open access journals, institutional repositories. We do not discriminate on the basis of religious orientation. So Brigham Young University, Liberty University, Notre Dame University, Duke, BYU, whoever it happens to be, anybody who has a religious studies PhD program will include their content. Scholarly societies, Society of Biblical Literature, uh, Pneumatic Society and Greco Roman coins of interest to us. Uh, various OA and Creative Commons publishers, Princeton Theological Commons, Globe Ethics, Internet Archive, the Audi Trust, all that content related to religious studies. Museums like the Met and the MoMA often have uh, art history stuff that bears on religious studies. Denominational archives, the Methodists and the Lutherans have dumped a lot of things in for us. We only need two pieces of information to make this work. We need an OCLC number, and nearly every every ebook is already cataloged anyway, and a stable URL. The way we do this, the record looks like this, so you'll see the OCLC number there and the website. That's what the back end of it looks like. These are some titles the University of Chicago had put on their website and were available nowhere in OCLC as an ebook. So what we did is link the existing OCLC print book record to an ebook and made it discoverable. Uh, it wasn't even discoverable as an ebook in Chicago's system. And that's very common, by the way. What we do is we'll find the OCLC world, the OCLC member in WorldCat, then add, look it up in our discover, or the back end of our discovery system. We look it up by OCLC number so we get the right uh, item. And these are all professional librarians doing this work. There are three pieces of data that we need to work to make it work. It's very simple. We simply change here from book to ebook. That's what this arrow is. Make sure it has a stable URL. I have one minute left. And make sure the OCLC number's in there. The takeaways. If you are a WMS library, use WorldShare, activate the, DL, the DTL OA collections. Any collection we create, we eventually globalize after we've done a second quality check and we use the prefix DTL OA so people can find them, activate those collections, uh, curate and globalize your own collections and we'll add those to the OA DTL. If you're not a WMS library, you can still go to the collection manager at OCLC and download the KBAR sheets and add those to your collection. All other libraries, add us to your NZ list, oadtl.org. Okay. And I have 10 seconds left. <laughs> from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, the Public Access Submission System, or PASS, is a software platform that supports simultaneous submission of articles in the Public Central and in institutional repository, thereby aligning funding agency of, uh, public access compliance with institutional open access compliance. PASS is designed to raise the motivation for our researchers to participate in open access programs and reduce the burden on them to meet with their existing compliance with their grants. By embedding the article and data into existing research workflows, we think it makes a more seamless and efficient process for them. PASS can ultimately provide a framework for institutional data analytics, particularly as it relates to grants data. So I'm going to show you a series of screenshots, but the system is live at Hopkins right now, and we also have a demonstration version. This is the main dashboard screen you see when you log into PASS. So when I use my institutional credentials, this is what I would see. On the left is a link to see status of submissions, which I'll come back to at the end. And on the right uh, is a link so that you can initiate a submission tied to one of your grants. So if you click on the grant submission link, we are harvesting the grants data from our institution. So this is actually the list of grants for which I'm on the PI. Uh, there's a couple of additions for demonstration purposes. So at the very bottom, you see this NIH grant and this little new submission link. So if you click on that, you start the submission process. The first thing to do is, of course, add the metadata associated with this article. You can add that manually. But if you have a DOI, we do a live uh, real-time lookup of Crossref to get all that information. The next step in the workflow is to verify the grants that you are binding to this article. So you see the grant that I chose. If that's a mistake, you can remove it. 
If there are other grants that supported this work, you can add that at this screen right here. The next step in the workflow is to verify the relevant policies that are appropriate for the submission, since it's an NIH grant and the JHU researcher, you see the NIH policy and our, my institution's policy. This is a so-called method B submission, according to the National Library of Medicine, which means that if you pay a fee to publishers, they will submit on your behalf. You do not need to pay that fee. You can use this system and avoid paying that fee and submit it directly. So I'm simulating that I've made that choice and that's how I'd like to proceed. The next step verifies the repositories that are relevant for the submission. So because it's NIH, it's PubMed Central. Because it's JHU, it's J Scholarship, which is our institutional repository. This list of repositories would be extensible, and then we can add other article repositories and eventually add data repositories as well. The next step are a series of review screens. So this is showing you the metadata that was harvested from that DOI. You can go in and make changes if necessary to uh, some of the fields. You are not allowed to change the metadata associated with the DOI itself. The other screen, the other aspect of the screen is the deposit agreement for our institutional repository. We've got, talked to the National Library of Medicine about including their deposit agreement in this screen as well, thereby eliminating one more step. Assuming you agree to that, you move to uploading the files. Uh, you, at this point, would be uploading the files from your local system. You would either upload a manuscript, a supplement, a table, or a figure. And eventually, we would add the data that are cited within this article as well. Uh, down here on the bottom right, there is a free text form where you can enter, the researchers can enter description or descriptive words in whatever way they wish. We would imagine starting to do text mining on all of those entries and mapping those to the metadata from the DOIs. If you hit next, you would go to the submit screen. It's one final review step. When you hit submit, the article goes into PubMed Central and it comes into our institutional repository at the same time. Additionally, we create a package of the article, the data, the DOIs, the metadata with the DOI, ORCID IDs if they're available, and the grants data. And we create a Fedora resource and put them into a Fedora institutional repository. So that means that you can use that package for linked data explorations, or you can run analytics on that as well. Once you've submitted uh, your articles, you can go back to the submission status screen and check on the status of your submission by the name of the article or by the, uh, the grant. We are accessing the so-called Public Access Compliance Monitor that the National Library of Medicine runs. If you look at the bottom two entries here, you will see a PMC ID or a NIMS ID as it's called. If you're an NIH PI, you need those IDs to verify your compliance when you're submitting future NIH proposals. So for our researchers, some of them actually said, I don't even care about the submission. The fact that you're giving me these IDs in one dashboard is very helpful to me. I don't have to keep looking through email and talking to my grant's office uh, and so on. So the couple of URLs to give you more information, PASS is open source software. There's a link to our GitHub repository from the OSF project link, uh, the second one. On our roadmap is a pilot effort at Harvard and user testing at MIT, where they would be using an instance of PASS that JHU is hosting for them. Uh, we've talked about integration with additional funding agencies. There are actually 10 federal agencies that use PubMed Central in addition to NIH. There are agencies like NASA and the CDC. But we've also talked to NSF, the Department of Energy, and USAID about integrating with this system. Uh, as I mentioned, we have plans to build a data archive so you could add the data that are cited by the publication. I've talked to on paywall about using their API so that you could do a search using the DOI to find the right version of your article rather than having to find it locally in your hard drive. And we've started some conversations with some faculty profile systems about interoperability. I will end with some acknowledgments uh, about the institutions and the people that made this happen. Thank you. why libraries should purchase textbooks. Textbook costs have skyrocketed in recent years, making it difficult for students to afford them. Some students choose to go without, which could adversely affect their grades. 
By providing textbooks to students who may not have had access otherwise, the libraries can positively contribute to student success, which also supports a university-wide mission. As we assist with student success, we also increase student retention and possibly even recruitment efforts. It also gives the library a good public image and increases students' awareness of other library resources and services. In seeing a new opportunity through which students' academic needs to support them, uh, the Access Services Librarian and I just started, decided to start the Golden Eagle, Eagle Textbook Initiative, or GETI. Uh, we applied for a grant from the University of Southern Mississippi Foundation. Uh, they awarded us $10,000, the library uh, obligated another $5,000, and then the Student Government Association also pledged $1,000 in support. The Getty Grant began in the fall of 2017 and concluded July 30th, 2018. The purpose was to uh, purchase grant, uh, print material textbooks for the general education courses taught on the Hattiesburg campus. We have multiple campuses, but it was just for the main campus. We decided to purchase one book for each 50 students enrolled in a section with a maximum of five per section. Textbooks were put on reserve at the circulation desk with a three hour checkout period. Uh, we obtained materials from several different sources. To ensure that materials came in quickly and time for the start of the semester, we ordered some through Amazon. However, not everything was available for purchase outside the Canvas bookstore. We found that several of the sections have course packets specially made for them. Uh, so there were numerous materials that we had to buy directly from the bookstore on campus. Several of the textbooks also included digital copies of text as well as access to related assignments. Those copies came with an access code that only allowed for a single user, and we were unable to circulate those codes, so they were all removed. We also made the decision that as textbooks go out of date quickly, upon the removal of materials from a course, we would evaluate each through our normal gift policy for possible inclusion into one of our collections. However, we need to consider that not all classes are offered every semester, so materials should not go to gifts too quickly. This aspect of textbooks impacted their cataloging as well. As not everything would be retained permanently, it was quicker to set a brief record template uh, for getting materials with full records to be added only if we we're going to include them in our collections permanently. In addition, materials also received only minimal physical processing. There was only one property stamp, there was no security strip, um, since it was going to be placed on reserve behind the circulation desk anyway, and they also did not receive any call numbers. The library advertised the program in several different ways. Here's an example of one of the cards that were handed out at events across campus. A digital copy was included on the library homepage, and information about Getty was also included in several campus uh, listservs, email listservs. Uh, word of mouth, reference librarians mentioning the program in instruction sessions, Professors talking up the, in their classrooms or other ways that Getty was promoted. We also placed signage around the library. These were located at some of the service points and in the elevators. For the grant period, we purchased a total of 139 textbooks for a total cost of almost $11,700. The cost of each book ranged from $250 on the low end for materials such as Othello, uh, to almost $275 for a textbook in the sciences. And the average book cost was $84.14. After the grant concluded in June, we were able to run reports to get statistics on use. Use ran from zero to 36 per book, with a total of 713 uses for the entire Getty collection, for an average of a little over five uses per book. The Golden Eagle Textbook Initiative received great feedback from faculty and students. Although the grant has ended, the program will be continued for a second year, fully funded by university libraries. It's really nice to hear students come in and tell us that I need to look for a textbook that my professor has said that you all have that can help me. Uh, cost for year two for the Getty program should drop down to about $6,000 due to several factors and changes that we have made. Textbooks are adopted on a three-year uh, year cycle. Uh, as a result, materials are used repeatedly for several semesters and or years. This helps cost drop after the initial year when we started from scratch. 
The results of the usage statistics and consultation with circulation staff showed that no more than two copies of any title were checked out at one time. So we decided that we would make the decision to purchase a max of two instead of five per section. Uh, we will be purchasing most textbooks from the bookstore each semester in the future. This decision was made after getting a snag at the beginning of this year. Textbooks are usually decided uh, by July 1 for the fall semester. We ordered a couple of books on Amazon at that time, and about a week before classes started, they changed the text because a new edition was out. So we purchased some things unnecessarily. Um, so now we're going to go to the bookstore. The bookstore has its pros and cons. Uh, I have to physically go down to the bookstore to purchase the materials and bring them back. However, this is the quickest delivery option we have on any of our materials. However, the bookstore tends to be priced higher than other vendors. They don't always have new titles in stock and we must purchase used, although they are cheaper. Uh, they also on occasion do not have a title in stock until a week or two into the semester, so the library is late obtaining materials. However, we feel the benefits outweigh the costs. And since we have to purchase university-specific packages there anyway, we're going to purchase the bulk of them at that time. Um, we also plan to approach faculty to try to obtain desk copies of text textbooks for general education courses and to hopefully extend the program to some of the higher-level courses. We also see um, we're purchase we'll probably purchase a few less items because of other programs that are expanding open um, textbooks and. Um, just open source materials in general that are freely available, like uh, open stacks. Uh, the Getty program has allowed library to help students succeed at the university to provide them access to materials they may have otherwise have gone without. Although the grant has ended, we hope that the program will continue to grow and be something that we can maintain for the foreseeable future. directions for library collections. At the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, um, we are made up of six academic colleges, and that includes medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, graduate health sciences, health professions, and nursing. And so the Health Sciences Library, we help all of these colleges with our collections, as well as instruction and research support. Looking specifically at our ebook collections, we provide ebooks through Access Medicine, Clinical Key, EBSCO, and the R2 Digital Library. Within these packages, they happen to include some required course textbooks, but that wasn't done on purpose. So we like to say that we have been incidentally supplying student textbooks, but we are curious about whether or not we should intentionally be providing more textbooks for our students. We've also received a number of requests over the years from both faculty and students about whether or not their textbooks are available. Um, and so that prompted us to explore potential new directions for our collection to be more inclusive of textbooks. Uh, we decided to survey the faculty first on their levels of satisfaction with our current collection and their potential feelings about an e-textbook program. Instead of gauging the temperature of the entire campus at once, we decided to focus on one college to begin with, and we selected the College of Nursing. This was largely due to the fact that we have a long-standing relationship with them. Um, I'm the liaison to the College of Nursing, and I receive collection requests from the faculty on a regular basis about whether or not their course textbook is available online. The survey that we used, we adapted it um, from research that was previously done for our own research goals. After that was finalized, we sent it to campus IRB for approval. And then we housed our survey using Qualtrics, not only for its ability to send out the initial survey invitation through email, um, but it, you can also send reminders only to those who have not yet completed the survey, which is helpful. And we sent that out to full-time um, faculty only. Within our survey, we included some questions that are outside just the textbook scope because we want to take advantage of the fact that we're sending out a survey. Um, so we included some about database use, journal use, general demographics, and then article processing charges in relation to open access publishing just to get as much information from our faculty as possible. We sent out the survey on August 20th and closed on September 4th, so we collected our responses over a two-week period. Um, this includes the initial invitation and then two reminders that were spaced out over time. 
We sent it to 91 faculty and 28 completed for a response rate of 30.7%, which we were fairly pleased with. For demographics, this shows the years of teaching experience. Um, just over 42% have been teaching for only five years or less, so those who chose to respond are relatively new in terms of their teaching experience. Um, some of our non-textbook question highlights that we wanted to share were that 50% of the faculty were likely to use Sci-Hub or a similar website to locate research articles if we didn't have them available in the library. Um, this wasn't a surprise, but confirmation that PubMed is the database that they start their research with the most. And we found only 7.14% have previously published open access articles, um, which was lower than we expected. Our textbook question section opened with this statement. Um, so this section was made up of five statements, um, and we asked them to respond true or false. The first, um, nearly 90% said it was true that they believed that we should expand our access to resources that include student textbooks. Um, and so that means that our collection should probably be moving in new directions by being more inclusive. From faculty, they are the ones who are responsible for selecting their course textbooks, so we wanted to ask them um, if the availability would influence the decision-making process, and we found that it did. Um, over 80% said that the availability would make it more likely that they choose it as their assigned textbook. And then still the majority, and just over 60% said that they would even recommend an alternative to one of their current course textbooks if it was available through the library database. Of course, we have to have money to purchase these things, and so we were curious about whether or not they would support a student fee, um, so that student fee would be collected and it would allow the library to license those resources that include student textbooks, and this would replace students having to individually purchase the physical or e-copies on their own, um, and nearly 80% agreed, and so that was true. In this statement, I was particularly glad to see that over 90% said that they would welcome the inclusion of the librarian on their curricular committee. Having the librarian on those committees, it would just help them make the decisions to find the best resources that match their instructional goals. Um, so that was great to see from them. Some overall conclusions from the survey is that yes, there was faculty interest and support of the e-textbook program. Our e-resources are being used and are meeting the research needs of the nursing faculty and that there is opportunity for further librarian involvement through the participation in curricular committees to select textbooks. In this project, uh, we had some lessons learned, and the biggest was that we sent out the survey uh, around the beginning of fall semester, which is a very busy time of the year. We had wanted to send it out sooner during the slower summer semester, but we just didn't have um, the IRB in time, and so we might have had a higher response rate if we didn't send it out during summer. So we're keeping that in mind as we move to the future. Um, continuing to look to the future, we are using the data that we gathered from this project to set up meetings with nursing administration and the Student Government Association um, to move forward with this pilot e-textbook program. <coughs> and we also use the support from the survey to make a case for the inclusion of um, the, the librarian on the curriculum committee for the Bachelor of Science and Nursing program. We are working towards adapting the survey to send it out to the other five colleges to make a UTHSC to see if their faculty would also be interested in a similar program and then their students. And we are hoping to explore additional options related to open educational resources for the faculty, staff, and students at UTHSC. In case you're interested, this is the reference for the article or that we got the survey from that we adapted. And thank you very much. Thanks to our five speakers. We've had five really excellent, innovative, and dynamic approaches to open access issues. We do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments for any of the five presenters? No? We're ready for a break? <laughs> well, if you, if you think of anything afterwards, you know, feel free to contact the speakers on your own. But I'd like to thank all the speakers for their excellent, very dynamic, fast paced presentations.